Welcome everyone. If you are going through the criminal justice system, this video you are going to watch today with my business partner, Michael Santos and federal judge Mark Bennett is absolutely for you. You've got to watch this and implement all of these incredible lessons that Michael and Judge Bennett share. Before I turn it over to that video, and really the reason I'm electing to post this video today stems from a call I received this morning from a defendant who is just utterly devastated that his sentence was extended six months into April of next year. And essentially he, he said, I already feel like I'm in prison. I'm not getting credit for it. I didn't want the delay. I just want to get on with my life. What do I do? This is going to be the worst holiday season ever. And I said to him, as I said to all of you, succeeding through the system requires us to prepare on days we may not want to. I use the analogy of people who exercise or run most of the time, much of the time they don't want to do it though, they still do it. You've got to do that that same thing, which is the reason I told this defendant who had not seen the video and if with Judge Bennett, and if you have not seen this video, please watch the full video in its entirety. It is a rare to interview a federal judge. It is pure gold to learn and watch this if you have not been sentenced. So I told this defendant, as I tell all of you, I know it's difficult waiting and living in the land of the unknown. You have absolutely got to prepare regardless. Lastly, a defendant recently asked about a book that Michael and I worked on last year called Prepare. And essentially he's like, dude, it's a 50,000 word book. I'm busy with kids and business and I can't read a 50,000 word book. And I said, well, of course you can read a 50,000 word book, though, if it's too daunting or if you don't have the time, let me make it simpler. So I shared with him and I share with all of you, I'm adding to the stream here before I turn it over to this video. I've taken every chapter from Prepare and I'm adding it as a blog on white collar advice. So if you wanna read the specific chapter on what is a sentence mitigation plan or learning more about the First Step Act and, and post-conviction proceedings, how to hire a lawyer, life in prison, I'm adding a chapter a day to the blog of White Collar Advice. So if you don't wanna read a 50,000 word book, great. Find a chapter that makes the most sense for you given where you are in the journey, read it, and of course implement everything you've learned. With that said, I'm gonna turn it over to my business partner, Michael Santos, and federal judge Mark Bennett. Of course, we hope you find huge value uh, in this rare interview with a federal judge. Enjoy and learn. Bye-bye. Well, judge, I'm, I, I'm so excited to do this. I know that a lot of people in prison are going to welcome this opportunity to listen and learn from you. And uh, I'm just doing the best that I can from home to try and help people prepare for a successful outcome when they come out of prison. And uh, well, you're certainly, just, uh, you're certainly a great role model for that. Well, I would like to. I'm re just so you know, I am recording the our conversation right now uh, on both audio and video, and I will be using this to uh, communicate the guidance that you can provide to people in prison. Um, so, if it's okay with you, I'd just like to have a, a, a bit of an organic conversation where we can listen and learn from you for, for those of us who listen to the Earning Freedom podcast so they can learn what they can do to start preparing for a successful life. And I think that, that the sooner they start preparing for that, the better. And I know that you have had a long career on the bench and you've sentenced more than 4,000 people. So I'd like to ask you, what have you learned from listening and to the people, the 4,000 people that have come before you um, with facing criminal charges and conviction, and you've had to sentence. Could you tell us just briefly what you've learned from, from that long history? Sure. There are a couple of lessons uh, learned from 23 years on the bench sentencing so many people in multiple uh, different federal court jurisdictions. A uh, couple of things I've learned is the war on drugs is a failure that so many of the people I sentence are really good people, but they've made bad decisions. Oftentimes they're low level uh, drug dealers, but they're really addicts. And, you know, so basically what I've learned is that the sentences required by Congress uh, are too harsh and that uh, too many people go to prison for far too long. Uh, while prison, um, tries, there aren't enough resources uh, to help people in prison to do much towards rehabilitation, although there, you know, there are some 
uh, efforts at that, but there needs to be more. And that, you know, the vast majority of people I sentence are good people who made bad decisions largely because of their addiction. So I think it's a really unfortunate situation that we've had this mass incarceration with these incredibly lengthy sentences. I'm not saying people don't deserve to go to prison, but in my judgment, uh, most people go to prison for far too long. So a lot of the people who listen to Earning Freedom, they come from really two different camps. Some of them are about to get sentenced. Some of them are already in prison. And in light of what you've just said, I'm curious to know what influence an individual who's, a, who's preparing to be sentenced, what influence would his version of events with regard to how he got involved in the case on the, on the pre-sentence investigation report, what influence does that have on decisions that you make as you consider that defendant? Well, that's really a very insightful question, Michael. And one criticism that I have, not so much of offenders, but the defense lawyers, is that so often they just go with the government's offense conduct statement, and they don't spend enough time with their client to contest matters in the offense conduct statement and give the offender's point of view because a lot of times when an offender does allocute and explain some things to me, it can differ in nuanced ways from the government's offense conduct statement and it can often be mitigating. So I think it's really important, I mean critically important, uh, to tell a, uh, a defendant to go over that pre-sentence report many, many times, ensure that it's totally accurate, read the offense conduct statement very carefully, and really tell your lawyer how important it is to get your version of the offense conduct statement in the pre-sentence report, and then you better have the facts to back it up if it becomes a contested issue in sentencing, which it, which it can be. Uh, then I listen to the evidence and I decide. And you know, more often than not, when a defendant is willing to contest the offense conduct statement, I find their version of the offense more accurate uh, than the government's version because the way it's prepared is the, either the probation officer is looking through the discovery file and draws his or her own conclusions, or the assistant U.S. attorney prepares a one-sided offense conduct statement. So I think it's very important, if an offender can, to challenge anything in the offense conduct statement to give a different spin on it that might then influence the judge to have a more favorable outlook towards the offender. Well, you're, you're, you have a lot of experience not only in sentencing 4,000 people, but I have had the opportunity to read some of your research papers, including one where you have reached out to, I think, more than 900 federal judges and asked them about the importance of the defendant's version of events or what brought them there. Could you tell our audience a little bit about what you've learned from some of your colleagues, some of the other jurists who have the awesome responsibility of determining how much punishment is, is, is warranted for a certain offense. Yes, I think the vast majority of federal judges uh, who do sentencing take the allocution or the statement by the offender, usually at the end of sentencing, very seriously and, and weigh that. And so uh, it's very frustrating when I ask a offender uh, who I'm about to uh, sentence, impose a sentence, would you like to say anything? I explain that they don't have to say anything. If they do say something, I can consider it. Sometimes it helps them. On rare occasions, it hurts them. Sometimes it makes no difference. But then I see uh, the individual look at the lawyer and it's like they're having for the first time, should I, you can even see him whispering to the lawyer, should I say something, shouldn't I say something? That discussion needs to take place long before sentencing because the allocution can have a huge impact, not, not in every case, but uh, across the board uh, in the empirical study I did, uh, allocution was a significant factor, hardly ever uh, raising a sentence, 
but uh, you know, a significant portion of the time uh, moderating a sentence. Maybe it doesn't result in a below guideline sentence, but it results in a judge who was thinking about sentencing in the middle of the guidelines to go to the bottom of the guidelines. And for many judges, it can result, it can make the difference between a guideline sentence and a lower uh, sentence. But there are certain cautionary things that offenders need to know about. For example, I had a sentencing just last week where I came very close to increasing the sentence based on the allocution because the offender, and I had already indicated I was going down to the mandatory minimum. So the offender probably should not have even given an allocution because I already said I was going down to the mandatory minimum. But the offender came very close to uh, talking me out of it because all he did was, you know, complain about the fact that uh, his family was upset at him and he had no empathy at all for any of the victims of the crime. It was all about him and his family. And I found that offensive. So good allocutions take responsibility for their conduct, uh, talk about the uh, impact it has on the victims, and, uh, and especially, uh, and this is pretty rare, indicate a solid plan of rehabilitation, what they think they can get out of prison programs and what they intend to do when they get out. And something more than, I just want to be a drug counselor when I get out because I hear that repeatedly and you just don't put much stock in it. But somebody who's actually taken affirmative steps to have a plan towards rehabilitation, that'll make a huge impact on a sentencing judge if it's sincere and believable. Judge, you, when we're speaking about allocution, I think I've heard you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard you talking about what the defense attorney can do to help the court understand the defendant. I, my question would be, what would, what would have a, a, a greater influence if the defense attorney is saying that my client did this, or if the defendant himself has taken the time to prepare what he's learned from the offense, how he identifies with the victim, what he's been doing to reconcile with society, what kind of measurable, deliberate plan he's going to take while he's in prison to prepare for success. When you weigh both of those, the defense attorney saying something or the defendant in a first-person narrative showing how much he is introspected, would one or the other have more influence on you? Uh, absolutely, Michael. You know, it's fine for the defense lawyer to give an overview, uh, a short overview of what he thinks his client has learned and how he thinks his client is making changes and will continue to make changes and why his client is motivated to do so. That's fine as an introduction, but the nuts and bolts of it, you need to hear from the offender, in my view, so that we can gauge uh, how thoughtful they are. Is this really sincere? Are they being credible? Is it realistic? You know, if they say uh, when they get out, they want to be an astronaut or they want to be a federal judge, probably not very realistic. Uh, but if they say something reasonable and they have a definite plan and it's thoughtful, that can be very powerful uh, in an allocution and uh, go a long ways towards uh, mitigating a, a sentence. And if the individual really wanted to take advantage of that wisdom that you just provided, would it behoove him to begin crafting that narrative and writing that narrative even before he has the pre-sentence investigation report so he could communicate that to the probation officer, thereby giving the judiciary an opportunity to review even before allocution and maybe test the theories that the defendant is offering at the pre-sentence investigation report? Well, that's one of the best ideas I've ever heard. And the reason why I haven't thought of it is I'm not sure I've ever seen it. But I would be super impressed in reading a pre-sentence report if I knew that the defendant had thought about that, even at the time the pre-sentence report was being prepared, rather than waiting till the night before sentencing to come up with it. So that would be 
uh, astoundingly impressive to me to have a defendant that thoughtful and a defense lawyer that thoughtful that they would include that information in the pre-sentence report. And the pre-sentence report, you know, you, because you read that, you know, it's primacy and recency, because you read that before you go into sentencing, I think most judges read any complicated pre-sentence report at least a couple of times, I know I do, uh, that helps shape your frame of reference and your thinking going into the sentencing. So having something positive like that, as long as it's believable and credible, um, would really be helpful and put you in a better frame of mind towards that individual. And if you were skeptical of it, you would have an opportunity then to think about it, what type of questions you might want to ask defense counsel or the defendant if they were willing to answer the questions to make sure that uh, the offender is being um, candid and, uh, and credible in their comments. I, 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 I appreciate you for sharing that, that wisdom because a lot of times defendants who are trying to prepare express some reluctance in, in writing out their life story because they are, they're afraid that it's going to go against something that the defense attorneys um, advising them. And, and I always try to advise them, this is a very important time for you to advocate for your, on your own behalf. As long as you're sincere, as long as you help the judge understand the motivations that led you into that situation, you can start bringing a common humanity where the, the court, and not only the court, but all stakeholders, including the probation officer, including the Bureau of Prisons, to start seeing this individual as uh, a flawed person, as we all are, but somebody who wants to try to make things better. And to the extent that the defendant makes that investment of time and energy to help the judge see him, I really, uh, I, I think I heard from you that he advances his possibilities for the best possible outcome. Um, another question. Go ahead, Judge. No, I was just going to say that uh, probably one of the main reasons I do downward variances are, you know, most defendants that I see uh, lack significant parental guidance. You know, some started using drugs when they were 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 or 12 years old. Sometimes it was the parents that got them using drugs. The parents were not very good role models. All of that, to me, is very important because it puts in context why they're in front of me. I mean, it's, it's never surprising when you read a background like that. What would be surprising about the fact that somebody started using drugs and selling drugs and winds up in front of a federal district court judge? Nothing. So I find lack of parental guidance and a very hard upbringing uh, almost always to be a mitigating circumstance that justifies the downward variance. Now, it, it doesn't always because it just, you know, every case is very case specific. And even after 4,000 cases, I don't generalize about cases at all. I look at the facts of every case, every case is different and make a judgment. So it's very important to put the life of the individual in context because that can often explain. It doesn't justify, but it does explain. And in my judgment, often mitigates what the punishment should be. Judge, how about uh, psychological evaluations. Some, sometimes a, a defense attorney, I mean, a, a defendant may have some mental instability or issues that influence his life. Do you find uh, it, it persuasive at all to have uh, professional guidance from psychologists or psychiatrists who have treated or mental health professionals? Do those types of reports have an influence and a bearing on, on decisions at sentencing as well? Yes. Depending upon the case, they may have more or less uh, influence, but I find uh, psycho well done psychological records and reports and medical history and reports uh, very helpful. There are some areas where uh, psychological or psychiatric evaluation is really critical. For example, in the uh, child porn sex offender cases, which every federal judge has seen more and more of, one of the key, because the statute is so broad and the punishment range is so broad and so incredibly high, one of the key issues for most judges is, 
is this somebody who's just viewing it on the internet and on their computer and sharing files, or is this somebody who's likely to go out and do hands-on uh, physical touching and sex abuse of minor children? And the best way, nobody can predict that with certainty, but I find it very helpful to have an excellent uh, psychiatric evaluation, and there are, there are some uh, psychological tests that help psychologists and psychiatrists predict the likelihood of people doing hand, engaging in hands-on uh, sex abuse with minors, and so that's an area that I find it very helpful. And I've had you know some reports done that say there's a medium or moderate high chance of reoffending and uh, physical contact with minors, and then I have reports that say uh, there's very little likelihood. And so, uh, depending upon who the psychiatrist or psychologist is uh, and what their credentials are and how much the experience they have in the area, uh, I find their information extremely helpful. So expert testimony that can explain the defendant's behavior or rather help the judge at least consider factors do have a, a role, at least in your courtroom. Absolutely, Ian. While I uh, read the expert witness reports very carefully, I like it better when the expert is called as a live witness, even if it's only for the purpose of adopting the report and then giving the government an opportunity to cross-examine the expert and then giving me an opportunity to ask questions that I might have of the expert. And I always do have questions. So uh, I'm likely to give more weight to a report when the government's had an opportunity to cross-examine the expert, usually they only make a couple of points. Um, usually it doesn't have much bearing on my judgment. And then if the expert answers my questions to my satisfaction, I'm willing to give the report considerable weight because they've answered any reservations or qualifications that I have about the expert's opinions. So, so we've I spoken find about... Extremely helpful. So we've spoken about experts. How about the defendant's character reference letters, getting letters from other people? Um, what level of, of influence do those character reference have at the sentencing hearing? Uh, I estimated uh, not too long ago, just a rough calculation, that I've read somewhere between 30,000 and 40,000 uh, character letters on behalf of defendants because it's not unusual to have seven, eight, or nine in a case. I had a case last year uh, where I had 93. That was a little bit too much. And they all look the same because I found out after questioning the defense lawyers, um, and they were very honest in responding, that uh, the wife of the defendant had sent out a form letter to all these people and it had some phrases in it, and the letters just adopted the phrases. So I didn't give much weight to those letters. But uh, I give a lot of weight to letters if it's somebody the person actually knows and how long and how well they know them. So I'd much rather have a letter from a street sweeper or a janitor that has known the individual for you know maybe more than 10 years or maybe most of their life than a letter from a state senator or a United States senator that's clearly writing it uh, 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 as a favor to the family and may or may not even know the individual. So the status of the person writing the letter has very little bearing on me. Uh, but it's what they have to say and how they came about acquiring the information that is helpful to me. And I get offended when they tell me what the sentence should be. So a lot of times, you know, please give the person probation. Well, maybe they're an armed career criminal and they're looking at a potential life sentence. Gee whiz, they're not going to get probation. And uh, maybe I'm just idiosyncratic, but I bristle when people tell me what I should do. Tell me how you know the person, what their characteristics are, and then let me decide how that fits into an appropriate sentence. 
your job isn't to tell a judge what an appropriate sentence should be. And so give me the facts, uh, uh, how you know the person, why you know them, what their good qualities are, what you think their prospects are for rehabilitation, anything that you think would be helpful, but stay away from actually telling me what a sentence ought to be because you're not in a position to know that. So that's kind of how I look at it. And I think most of my colleagues look at it uh, in a very similar fashion. Judge, I only have two more questions regarding preparing for the sentence. And one of them has to do with financial loss. If an individual knows that, that, that his behavior or his activities have resulted in financial loss to either victims or institutions, can he influence your perception of him if he starts making measurable efforts towards restitution even before the sentence was imposed? For example, perhaps sending, if he can send $50 a week or $50 a month or $100 a month, even if it's talking about millions of dollars in loss, if he starts that effort, even before sentencing, maybe as soon as the pre-sentence investigation report, would that effort, if it's measurable and meaningful, have an influence on, on your perception of the individual? Absolutely. That's much more impressive than saying in the allocution, I hope when I get out to start making restitution payments. You've started making restitution payments, and you probably don't have a lot of money. If you've hired a defense lawyer, they have most of your remaining funds. Uh, I'm being facetious there. But no, the fact that you've been willing, even if it's a small amount, if that's all you can afford. Uh, and you know what? I've never had a defendant tell me in sentencing that I'm looking forward to working in, in Unicor or prison industries so I can make a little bit of money and help start making restitution payments while I'm still in prison. I've never had anybody say that. Would I be impressed by somebody who said that rather than wanting to spend it on buying uh, candy bars in the commissary? You bet I'd be impressed by it if I thought it was sincere. And the last question on sentencing I have has to do with the number of people that a defendant may bring into the courtroom at sentencing to show support. In, does, that, does that in any way, if an individual brings family members or community members into the courtroom at sentencing does that speak anything to you at the sentencing hearing uh i think it op you know here's how i look at it um i think it operates more as a, on a subconscious level but it also it can operate um it can show that uh, there's, tr there's tremendous family and community support, and that can be a factor in the likelihood of somebody in terms of rehabilitation. On the other hand, oftentimes no one comes on behalf of the defendant, and I try not to let that influence me. Maybe the defendant is too embarrassed to have his family there, uh, and they just don't want them there. They don't want to put their children through the pain. Uh, so it's just a case-by-case -case basis. You like to see family support. If there are good letters, you know there's family support, and maybe uh, logistical problems, uh, they have to come from too far away. But it's usually impressive uh, to have people in the courtroom uh, supporting the uh, individual. And sometimes I've had them raise their hand and like it's a classroom and want me to call on them. And, and uh, usually I'll say, well, come to the podium, uh, tell us who you are. And, uh, and I'll ask the parties if they have an objection, usually they don't. And I'll actually take, you know, a kind of allocution from a non-defendant uh, because they came a long ways and they have something to say. And, you know, uh, I've been, uh, impressed by employers that come where the, the, the defendant has made full disclosure to the employer. They know that there's going to be a 10-year mandatory minimum, for example, but they want to come and assure me that even when the person gets out, there'll be a job there waiting for them because they think so highly of them. So having former employers there, uh, current employers, um, family members, you know, show us support. Uh, I think the Literature is pretty 
clear that the more support somebody has, the greater likelihood there is that they'll be rehabilitated. So I think that can be helpful. On the other hand, in white collar cases, when you have, you know, 100 people in the courtroom supporting a white collar defendant, and uh, they've written letters saying they didn't really think what he did was that bad, and, you know, he's really a great guy and all, uh, it can backfire a little bit too. So I think, you have, you know, the defendant and the lawyer have to use some judgment about how many people should should be there. Judge, I've read your really impressive testimony and work about going into prisons to visit people whom you've sentenced before. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned from visiting people who've actually been brought into the Bureau of Prisons and you went to see them years or perhaps in some cases decades after you imposed sentence? What has been made the most impression on you from visiting those people? Well, it reinforces my impression at sentencing that most of the people I sentence are good people who have made bad decisions, usually because of the influence of uh, drugs or alcohol or both. And so I'm, I come away from visiting inmates I've sentenced with a lot of mixed emotions, usually deep regret for the fact that I had to give such a long sentence if there was a mandatory minimum, but with great optimism that uh, they're making some, most of them are making the most of their experience. They've got a positive attitude. They're, they're working hard to stay in touch with their family. They're seeking skills to help when they get out. And, uh, I leave with uh, inspired by, by the people I meet uh, in prison. And they're often very different than the people uh, I sentenced. Um, uh, they've had a chance to think about things and uh, they've looked at their life and they realize this is no way to live and they're on the road to making major positive uh, changes. And to me, that's uh, both encouraging and inspiring and, uh, you know, I would like to see more of my colleagues uh, visit inmates that they've sentenced. I think they would realize that uh, so many of the lengthy sentences we give out aren't necessary uh, to get people on the road to rehabilitation, particularly when we have discretion not to give an extremely long sentence. It happens in rare cases, but perhaps one out of 10, if that many, or maybe it's one out of 100. But sometimes an individual has an opportunity to be resentenced again, whether it's a, a resentencing on direct appeal or a 2255, and that person goes before court. One of the things that I, I'm hoping that you will help me communicate to the people I, I mentor or communicate with in prison is that the decisions an individual makes in prison, his adjustment in prison, can have a massive influence whenever he gets out. But if that individual has the, the, the gift of coming before the court again to be reevaluated and reassessed. Tell us a little bit about your perception of how his adjustment, what type of investment he's made in educating himself and contributing to society in building support networks and showing a record of measurable steps that he has taken to emerge as a law-abiding citizen. Would that have an influence on you, on, on, on you in your courtroom if that person had an opportunity to come before you again for a resentencing? It absolutely does, and that was a classic case of mine that went to the United States Supreme Court, uh, United States versus Pepper, and uh, uh, Pepper got out, uh, and then I, I got reversed because I gave him too lenient a sentence, but he had done some great things both in prison and when he got out, and uh, the issue was could I consider post-sentencing rehabilitation? I said I could, I did, the Eighth Circuit twice said I couldn't, and the Supreme Court ultimately said, yes, you can. So I think that's very, very important. And uh, for the last couple months, I've been doing lots of uh, uh, commutation and pardon letters on behalf of individuals I've sentenced. And so I go back and read the sentencing transcript, read the pre-sentence report. But the number one thing for me is their prison record. What have they done? Have they have a clean discipline record or a 
close to a clean discipline record, and what steps are they taking to become a better person? What courses are they taking? Uh, what classes are they taking? Uh, are they helping other inmates? What are, what are they doing with their time? And uh, you know, it's been very rewarding the last couple months when the lists come out uh, of who President Obama has granted commutations and pardons to. I've had a number of people on those lists that I've written letters, and the reason why I wrote the letter was I've been so impressed by what they've been doing in prison, and that didn't just impress me. It obviously impressed the pardon attorney enough to make a recommendation to the president to grant a commutation or a pardon. So, uh, and there's always hope, you know, and uh, under this president, uh, we've had more people with life sentences given commutations and pardons than, than in the history of sentencing. So even if you get a life sentence, there is still hope and there's reason to try and make the prison experience the best experience you can uh, to convince not only a judge but your family members that you're making the most of it and that you want to go down a different path when you get out which is exactly what you did. I mean, that's your story to a T. You are the role model, the poster child for post-offense rehabilitation in prison and, and out of prison. And if more offenders in prison could model what you did, um, society would be so greatly enhanced. Well, although a lot of the people may never get an opportunity to have their uh, their sentence re revisited or a commutation, the vast, virtually everybody who's coming out of federal prison now will have a period of time of supervised release. And many of them will someday make a motion for requesting early termination. I think what you've just given us is a roadmap for those people, helping them understand that every decision they make while incarcerated, every decision they make to demonstrate they want to reconcile with society. Every decision they make that they want to build a strong support network of law-abiding citizens, that can have an influence on their life in prison and beyond. And I'm just so grateful to you, Judge Bennett, for, for really helping me communicate that message. I will be using this uh, episode uh, in prisons across the United States. And I think just the virtue of you talking with me, a man who did 26 years in prison and still on special parole, it will help inspire people and it will help people see that regardless of what's going on in the world, who's in the White House, what's going on in Congress, an individual can always work toward becoming something better. And I'm going to leave the last word with you, Judge, because I know your time is valuable and you've given us a quite a bit of time already. If you might have anything you might want to share with our audience. Well, everybody's time is valuable, particularly if you make the most of the time that you have. So I think that's a great point, uh, Michael. Um, I just want to say that the feeling is mutual. You have done so much and worked so hard to make such incredibly positive changes in your life that I'm so proud to know you. I'm so proud to consider you a friend. And you know what? I'd be absolutely thrilled if you were my next door neighbor because you've not only paid your debt to society, you've repaid it and you are repaying it over and over again. And that's really more than we can ever ask of anybody. So you're just a great role model. And I think uh, because you've walked the walk and you've had the experience and you served such an incredibly lengthy period in prison and you did so much to really rehabilitate yourself uh, and the networks that you've created for yourself, you're just a, it's the perfect example of the kind of path that can make a huge difference in somebody's life. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing. Thank My you, pleasure. Judge. I'm very privileged to, to, to have this friendship as well. And I will continue working hard to prove worthy of this trust that you've given to me. I really appreciate it.